talked about text, font, encodings, etc. on the previous slide. And obviously for, for many, many documents, those are the key part of ensuring that a document is retained and, and archived appropriately. Um, for some documents, however, color spaces are equally important. Not so many, but for, for some. And therefore, uh, all color spaces inside the document must be specified in device-independent manner. And that essentially ensures that every device should show the color in exactly the same way, within obviously the, the, the limits of what that device can support. If you print it on a black and white printer, you're going to get black and white even if the document had color in, but that's an extreme uh, case. We also disallowed encryption. Now encryption is used in PDF to support the use of passwords to open or change a document. And over 30 years, over 50 years, over 100 years, a password might get lost. And we don't want documents to be suddenly inaccessible because someone's lost the password. It comes down to being um, self-describing so that a document is, is complete in itself and you don't need anything else to get into it. And finally, the use of standards-based metadata is mandated. So this is when you put in the title of the document, when you put in the author, when you include things like history. Um, you need to use um, standards-based metadata such as Dublin Core, such as some of the other XMP constructs. And that's to make sure that the file is, is self-documenting. The PDFA1 standard is actually split into two conformance levels. Um, they're named PDFA1A and PDFA1B. The A and B are just intended to be neutral because there are some places where one of them is, is perfectly adequate. There are cases where um, the other would make more sense and, it's, and vice versa. Uh, PDFA1B is, if you like, the, the lowest common denominator in that it, it ensures retention of everything you need to make sure that every device shows the page in the same way, whether it's printed on screen. All the visual appearance is the same, is recorded. PDFA1A includes that, but it also talks about the, the structure on semantic properties of the text, which means that you can do um, text speech, or you can do text extractions for indexing, uh, and a whole variety of other things, and do those reliably. This in doesn't incidentally mean that you can't do text extraction or text to speech or whatever with a PDFA1B file. It just means it's easier and more reliable with PDFA1A. And there are maybe some cases where um, A1A allows you to do it, that B wouldn't. Uh, that would be relatively unusual for uh, Western Latin text, but possibly more common for, uh, for other scripts. I wanted to raise a, a slight caveat around a couple of, not really limitations of PDFA, but things that are not defined in PDFA that you need to be aware of. PDFA defines what must be in a file and how a reader reads it and displays it to you, prints it, etc. It doesn't define how you make the file in the first place. Many methods of creating PDFA files may, if they're improperly configured or you use the wrong software or whatever, end up changing the document. And in some cases, you may actually want that to happen. And I'm thinking here of things like font substitution, reflowing text, downsampling images, lossy compression, uh, like JPEG. The result may be a valid PDFA file, but it may not be exactly what you thought you were going to be archiving. So if you go directly from, let's say, a Microsoft Word file to a PDFA file, never look at that PDFA file, but put it in your, in your document management system for long-term archiving, you may actually not have reproduced what was in the Word file in the first place. The PDFA file is robust. It can be rendered repeatedly. But if it doesn't match what you put in at the top end of the funnel, then it, the process you use to do that conversion may not meet your needs. In extreme cases, you may need to inspect PDFA files after creation just to make sure that they look the same as the Word document. That would be an un unusual requirement to have to do that, apart from possibly during initial setup of your systems and methods and processes for creating PDFA files. And none of this, by the way, is any different to any other conversion or reproduction process. If you just print direct from Microsoft Word to a printer, it's not unheard of for the print not to match what you had on screen. So even something as, as simple and robust as most people think of as printing is not, is not perfect, and neither is creation of PDFA files, unless you're very careful. 
second thing PDFA does not talk about is how you retain those PDFA files, how you store them. What media do you store them on? What's the expected lifetime of that? Do you have a process for renewing that media? If you store on CD or DVD, it seems to be generally accepted that those have a lifetime of no more than 10 years. And perhaps you need to copy from one CD to another every 10 years just to make sure that you have reliable access to those documents. It also doesn't talk about records management, how, how you use it in a document content system, etc. So PDFA is supposed to be one component of your complete system. There are a number of other ISO standards that'll help with the rest, but those are not inside PDFA itself. Now looking a little ahead towards the future of the PDFA standards themselves. With every standard, there's a constant tension between two things. First of all, the value of a standard is that it's stable, that you can rely on it not changing. And this is especially true for a standard describing a format for long-term archiving. If you find a PDFA file 100 years from now and you need to be able to read the contents of that file, it's quite possible that there won't be an off-the-shelf PDFA reader that far away from here. But it's important that the standard, still be, the standard itself still be available so that if you actually really have to get something out of that PDFA file, you can sit down and recreate a reader and therefore access all of your PDFA files. So the stability and long-term accessibility of the standard is very important. On the other hand, new technology allows us to, to, to do th two things. First, things that we couldn't do before at all. And secondly, things that we could do before, we can do more efficiently with new technology. And just to take an example, one of the new things in PDF since PDF 1.4, which remember is the basis for PDF A1, is JBIG2 compression. JBIG2 can be really useful for compressing scanned documents. It's more efficient than CCITT Group 4, for instance, so you can get smaller files. The ISO decision right from the beginning in working on PDFA was that we would develop new versions of PDFA over time, but we would do that in such a way that doesn't invalidate or render inaccessible any previous versions. When we bring out a new version, it won't be PDFA 1, it'll be PDFA something else, and you'll still be able to get PDFA 1 from the ISO store. And as we do so, we'll also maximize backward compatibility between the new version and the old version, which means that in general you might expect vendors to support both PDFA 1 and as we do that we'll also maximize the backward comp compatibility between versions. What that means is that when a future version of PDFA comes out there's an increased likelihood that vendors will support PDFA 1 in that software as well as PDFA 2, PDFA 3 etc. So what is the plan? Well this is what we are looking at at the moment. Obviously things may change over time as, as we develop the further ideas. PDFA 1, published back in 2005, don't forget the technical core agenda from 2007, based on PDF 1.4. There is already a PDFA 2 in development, in fact it's been in development for some years now, and we expect that to be published next year in 2011. That's based on the first ISO version of PDF, which is ISO 32000 part 1, published this year. And obviously PDFA2 takes advantage of the new capabilities in that version of PDF, including the example I used earlier of JBIG2 compression. Probably the most important other aspect of PDFA2 is that we've taken the lessons that real-world users of PDFA1 have, have told us about and added um, new, new things into PDFA2 or tuned things slightly where they weren't working quite right in PDFA1. There isn't much of that, but just a little bit. And then looking further ahead, um, there's a proposed PDFA3, which is intended to open up uh, PDFA into slightly more interactive uses of PDF. And obviously we'll also be keeping that up to date with new versions of the PDF standard itself, ISO 32000, going forward. So that covers uh, the plan for PDFA.